When I started cruising, I made loads of mistakes and it saddens me that when I go cruising today, I still meet so many first-time cruisers making those same mistakes that I did. That's why I've pulled together these seven things that anyone thinking of going on their first cruise needs to know to have a fantastic first cruise. So welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge and it's my goal to make it fun and easy to discover, plan and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations. I made the mistake of charging off on my very first cruise without thinking carefully about the right place to go to first. Now, luckily, I actually stumbled into going on a cruise that was right. Unlike people I met on my next cruise, which was a crossing on Queen Elizabeth II, where they realized the first day into a seven-day all-sea day trip that they found sea days boring and tedious. Now, from my experience and talking to happy first-time cruisers, I recommend all first-timers stick to one of the three most popular cruising regions, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, and Alaska. They are popular for a reason. Not only do they call on great places, but these regions and ports are well proven and geared up for cruising and the needs of cruise passengers, including first timers. There'll also be a wide range of excursions that the lines and the ports have found over time are what cruisers want to do and enjoy. And because these regions are so popular, all the cruise lines are there, which means you will have lots of choice, which, as I will explain next, is very important. Choosing the right cruise line is critical. Get on the right cruise line and you'll love it. Get on the wrong cruise line and you'll hate your first cruise. Now, my first cruise was on Pinot Cruises, a line I found too British and was like staying at home for a vacation. I actually wanted to meet much more diverse nationalities and experience something much more exotic than something I was pretty used to and familiar with. I've been on many, many cruises where people are miserable as they are on the wrong line, which are just completely wrong for them. So for example, a family that loved to party booked themselves on a Cunard trip that I was on out of Sydney. Cunard is very formal. It's heavy on enrichment talks. It's not big on partying. I had met another couple on their first cruise who didn't want to be with families and kids, but they actually booked themselves on a Royal Caribbean cruise, which is often packed full of families. It can be complicated choosing the right cruise line as there are just so many cruise lines and each one is very carefully designed to cater for someone different. Now, broadly speaking, there are four key categories of cruise lines. The biggest category, certainly in terms of passengers carried, are the mass cruise lines, which are very resort-like. These are cruise lines like Carnival, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian Cruise Line, and the more recent and fast-growing MSC cruises. Now, these tend to be very large ships, which are actually getting larger and larger. Expect many ships in this category to be mega ships carrying over 3,500 passengers or even more. They have a huge range of cabins, ranging from very inexpensive inside cabins that could cost you under $100 a night out of season, through to massive and costly suites, which could cost you $80,000 for a week. But importantly, these lines have lots of facilities and lots of choice. You'll find many entertainment venues, big production shows. On some ships, you'll even find go-karts and ice skating rinks. You'll also find a myriad of different themed restaurants and bars. It's very, very resort-like and are therefore popular with families, young couples, and people that love active, busy, and high-energy resort-like vacations. So if that's something that appeals to you, these are the cruise lines you should gravitate towards. The next category of cruise lines is what is generally known as premium cruise lines. These tend to be mid-sized to large ships ranging from maybe just under 2,000 to about 3,400 passengers. This category includes lines like Princess, Holland America, Celebrity, Virgin Voyages, Disney Cruise Line, and Cunard Cruise Line. These lines also offer cabins ranging from inside to suites. They tend to have a more classical cruise experience and don't usually have all of those big resort features. They still have a wide choice of facilities like number of different specialty restaurants, lots of bars, but much, much fewer than you'll find on the big resort ships. These lines are more sedate than the resort-like ships 
and the entertainment and activities will be geared more to things like quizzes, talks, bingo, cooking displays, movies, smaller scale production shows, but we'll still of course have pool parties and other kind of events like that. The next category, which is very similar in cruise experience to those premium lines, but just on a much smaller scale, is the small cruise lines category, which probably a little bit more luxury than the premium lines just because of their size. So these include lines like Oceania, Viking, Azamara, Saga Cruises, and Windstar. They carry between 600 and say 1,200 passengers. This is probably my favorite category of all, to be honest. They of course have less choice because they're smaller. They have a traditional cruise experience and many will still offer though inside through to suite kind of cabin choice. Then there is the ultra luxury or the six star category as it's sometimes known. These are mostly all suite ships, often with only 600 or fewer guests. They have a lot of things included in their fares. They have a very high passenger to crew ratio, so very, very high on the service level. And this category includes lines like Seabourn, Silver Sea, Region Seven Seas, the new Ritz Carlton Yacht, uh, Ponant and Hapag Lloyd, the European lines are also in this category really. So as you can see, there is a lot of choice, but how do you choose which of all of those is right for you? Write a list of what's important to you on a vacation. So for example, my partner likes big production shows, a big casino with lots of gaming options, a big gym with lots of fitness classes to do. You perhaps want a relaxed dress code, you want to be adult only, you want ballroom dancing or late night partying or so on. So basically decide what's really important to you and then use that to find the cruise line that meets that list the closest. If you're doing the Caribbean, the Mediterranean or Alaska, as I suggest, your chosen line is almost certainly going to be cruising in that region. But you then have an even more key decision once you've decided the cruise line that you have to make. People said to me before my first cruise, don't worry about your cabin. You're not going to spend a lot of time in there. You're going to be out enjoying the ship. I wish I had ignored that advice as the cabin I had was above the fitness center and we were woken up early every single morning with a thumping bass noise of the classes, which then recurred throughout the day. And even in the early evenings, we had that thumping noise disturbing us. I learned on that very first cruise that if you have a cabin that is noisy or in the wrong location, it can badly affect or even ruin your trip. When it comes to booking a cruise, you'll be given two options. Cruise lines will offer you a guaranteed fare. And this means that you choose a specific category inside ocean view, balcony, or a suite. But you don't get to choose a specific cabin. They will allocate one to you. You have another option where you get to choose your specific cabin. Some cruise lines charge a slight premium for that, others don't. I always go with choosing my own cabin fare. And there's a simple rule once you do that, that you should follow. Choose a cabin which is surrounded by other cabins on all sides, the left, the right, above, below, and also opposite you. This is gonna mean that you're less likely to be near a noisy or a busy venue or in a high traffic area that's likely to cause any kind of disturbance. Other than making an error on choosing a cabin, there is another area that trips up many first time cruisers, including me, budgeting. On my first cruise, I was totally shocked to find that I spent over half of what we'd paid for the cruise once we were on board again. There were so many extras and so many costs we had not thought about or budgeted properly for. When it comes to cruising, do not focus only on the fare that you see advertised. Focus on the concept of door to door. Many studies have confirmed, by the way, what I found on that first cruise is that cruise passengers will spend between half and 100% of the fare that they've paid once they get on board. Every single cruise line has different inclusions and exclusions within their fare, which makes it more complicated. And also what they do have included and excluded keeps changing. 
Now, generally speaking, the mass market lines have lots of exclusions. So, of course, you'll have your meals included and the basic entertainment included, but you'll then find there will be lots of added items. Now, the key things to watch out for and to focus on are obviously getting to and from the ship, but then gratuities, Wi-Fi, drinks, excursions, and speciality dining. Of course, you need to think about things like the spa or the laundry or the casino or, or shopping or whatever. The premium and the small ship lines, so that's line like Princess, Oceania, and so on, they tend to have many extra costs on board as well, although some of those are moving to more all-inclusive fares, so that's something to look out for. If you go ultra-luxury, you're going to find that many of those things that I've mentioned are already included. So when looking at your cruise, don't just focus on the fare and go for the lowest fare. Understand what you're going to have to pay for extra. I have two other tips, though, around budgeting that I think you should think about when booking that very first cruise. The best times to book a cruise are either when cruises first go on sale, as this is actually when cruise lines tend to have fantastic deals and offers because they want to sell them early on, and the next period is within 90 days of a cruise departing. Final balances generally have to be paid 90 days before a cruise departs. So the cruise line at that point knows how much capacity they've got left, and they then work really hard to discount and get every single cabin filled because cruise lines want to sail full because they make all that money once we're on board. Now, the other tip I've got around budgeting is always track your fare, because if your fare goes down, you can go back to the cruise line and ask them to reduce that fare. The cruise lines generally won't come to you and tell you that the fare has gone down. I had an email just today as I was preparing this from someone on the channel who told me that they had got $800 off their cruise fare by tracking the fare following this advice. Now, they had tracked it on a site called Cruise Watch, but there are other sites you can track fares pretty easily, like on Cruise Critic, for example. They then called the cruise line, which was actually a Norwegian cruise line, and got $800 taken off their fare. So really, really key budgeting tip. Now, I mentioned excursions is one of the big add-on costs. So is there any way to cut back here? Perhaps, but with one big watch out, which I really do need to explain. On my first cruise, as I had lots of travel experience, I thought I would do my own thing in the ports rather than book cruise line excursions. So in our very first port, which was actually Barcelona, I headed off and started exploring. But I actually found it all a bit stressful because I kept worrying about going too far away from the port in case I got lost and not having enough time to get back to the ship in time for it departing. So I never quite relaxed and enjoyed the port and limited what I actually ended up doing in Barcelona, which is crazy. When it comes to excursions for a first time cruise, I strongly recommend that you stick with as much as possible the cruise line excursions, certainly for that very first cruise that you're doing. I actually did that for the rest of the ports that I did on my first cruise. It was much more relaxing and I really enjoyed all of the ports I did after that Barcelona one. The reason for doing cruise line excursions is partly because cruise lines have a range always of very well proven excursions for each port that they've got proven over time. But much more importantly, they guarantee that the ship will wait past any scheduled departure time if any of their excursions are delayed for any reason. But people who've gone on independent tours or perhaps self-explored as we had in Barcelona, they will not wait for you if you are late. The ship will leave without you. So as a first time cruiser, going on a cruise line excursion is a great idea because it just gives you that sense of reassurance. Now, of course, as you build up experience, as you learn how to understand how things work, then start looking at doing your own thing. So for your next cruise, you can then be a little bit more adventurous. But if you really, really don't want to go on a cruise line excursion, I recommend using one of their either explore on your own transfers into the closest town because that counts as an excursion. It costs very little and they will wait for those on your own tours to come back or use the hop on hop off bus if one calls into the port. Now, many cruise ports have these buses. They synchronize the timetables with the ship schedule and you can normally make sure that you know the timing to get back in time before the ship departs. 
One big watch out for a first time cruiser is that we are agreeing lots of things that we may not realize the significance of when you book a cruise. Let me explain. I really realized this when on our first cruise, one of the ports of call was Monte Carlo. It was canceled on the morning because the weather made docking or even mooring outside and tendering of the ship to land just impossible or too risky. So we just had a sea day. There was no compensation offered or any other gesture was made. The cruise contract that we agreed to simply by booking a cruise line has many, many conditions. For example, as I learned, we must accept and we agree that the line can change the itinerary or the ports of call basically at will, and we have to accept it without the right to compensation or, or often even the ability to cancel a cruise, even if a port that we really wanted to go to and book the trip for is dropped off the itinerary. They also usually have really strict cancellation terms, which even won't allow you to change the name of the person you're cruising with. So if someone drops out and you want to bring someone else, they count that as a full cancellation. You need to check that. You need to take time to understand what you're agreeing to and look carefully at the terms and conditions. This, in my view, has become even more important because as we saw as cruising resumed after the shutdown, we probably want much more flexibility, the ability to change or cancel if the protocols that the cruise lines are putting in place on board change and are not to our liking. You know, sudden or constant changes to vaccination rules, testing, masks, or whatever. And as we move forward, how that evolves and what the protocols are gonna be for cruising for the here moving forwards, we don't really know. So ask and be clear what your options are if you want to change or cancel your cruise. Really understand that, really, really important. To find out more in-depth tips on each of these areas, I put together this short playlist of five videos, starting with how to overcome the biggest challenge that you'll face when it comes to choosing and booking that very first cruise. See you over there.